chapter 6. Tonight the third message on deacons and God's requirements for deacons. These are not man's requirements. These are God's requirements. And when God requ God's requirements are met, the church will have good deacons, and we'll see later God's requirements for elders too, and it will have good elders when it meets God's requirements. We have in Acts chapter 6, we'll begin reading with verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among, your, among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they, that is the apostles, had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again as we come to study your word, that you have given us a definitive word. You have given us exactly what you have ordained. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings upon the going forth of your word tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For this is your word, and we pray for your blessings upon it, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may recall the first week as we were looking at uh, the office of deacon, we saw very three what seemed to be very simple requirements that are set forth for us here in Acts chapter 6. They had to be men of honest report. They had to be men who were full of the Holy Ghost. They had to be men who were full of wisdom. But as we began to look at this, uh, this issue of honest report, we discovered that that term and that idea is spread throughout the New Testament. And uh, it is very important because these are going to be men who handle money. 
And so if they are not impeccable in the way in which they deal with material things, they are not qualified to be deacons. The second thing is they had to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And as we track the issue of the filling of the Spirit of God, we saw that it was actually men who are controlled by the Spirit of God. Uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. He contrasts the way in which wine affects a person with the way in which the filling of the Spirit affects a person. A man who's filled with wine has his mind controlled, his speech controlled, and his actions controlled by the wine. In the same way, a man who is filled with the Spirit will have his mind controlled, his speech controlled, and his actions controlled by the Spirit of God. And then we saw that it was to be men who were full of wisdom. And that is perhaps the, the thing that was most expansive as we looked at all the passages, well, didn't look at all the passages, but looked at some of the passages in the New Testament, and of course it reflects back on the whole book of Proverbs, men who are full of wisdom. And wisdom is very extensive, and we saw the character qualities of wisdom. Summarized by James, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The first character quality of wisdom that James lists for us is purity. Moral purity is an absolute essential for a man who would hold the office of a deacon. And so as we looked at all those different character qualities and trans, uh, transferred them to the office of deacon, uh, which is what is being done here in Acts chapter 6, we saw that it is a very responsible office. It's a high office. It's an office which is an office of service, and yet it is an office that has great requirements placed upon it. Last week we moved into the uh, passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3, which also talks about the office of of a deacon. We looked at the term for a deacon. We saw that when we looked at verse 8 of 1 Timothy 3, chapter uh, 7, excuse me, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8, uh, the word likewise shows up, referring us back to the character qualities of elders, which are in the preceding verses. And so those moral qualifications for elders also are qualifications that deacons must have. We saw their impeccable testimony in verse 7. We saw verse 7 speaking of the reproach of the devil and the snare of the devil. And that's followed by the likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, and so forth. A very high standards. Well, as we went through that study last week, I think some people got discouraged. And that's why right at the end, just before we had our closing prayer, I said, you know, what we're looking at here for the office of a deacon is not something that is extraordinary. In fact, if you look at each of these qualifications, you will discover that these are qualifications for the normal Christian life. I'll be saying more about that a little bit later tonight. But the normal Christian life is what all of us are supposed to be living. All of us should be of honest report. All of us should be filled with the Holy Spirit. All of us should be filled with wisdom. These are things that are not abnormal. These are things that Christians who are serious about their relationship with Jesus Christ will manifest in their daily life. And so we pick up on those verses in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, in summary. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. And I'm glad that the Apostle Paul had to write them so that we have them today. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. This is essential to the functional foundational issues that relate to the church. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, 
justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. These are very key doctrinal areas where deacons and elders likewise, for it ends that entire section dealing with the elders and the deacons, where they must be thoroughly grounded and able to refute the gainsayers and preach the faith truly and accurately and clearly and boldly and without compromise. Very important doctrinal issues, huge doctrinal issues covered there in verse 16. Now last week when we looked at the term deacon, we saw that verse 8 envisions the plurality of deacons. Likewise must the deacons, plural, be grave. We also saw the plurality of deacons at the church at Philippi in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. We noted that when Jesus sent out his disciples, he sent them by twos. And so we find a plurality among the deacons because they are going to be caring for widows. And there is safety in more than one who are involved in that ministry. The term deacon means servant. We saw it as used of literal servants at a wedding feast. It's used of angelic beings in the parables of Jesus. It is used as the basis for the spiritual office of deacon as found in the example of Christ. And we gave you illustrations out of the Gospel of Matthew. We saw the spiritual gift of ministration is essential to the exercise of the office of deacon. We saw the term translated deacon is also translated frequently as minister. We saw the verbal form of the word is translated to serve. We saw the various forms of the word are used of Timothy and Erastus, Paul and Barnabas, Onesiphorus, the Hebrew Christians at Jerusalem, and the service rendered by the Old Testament prophets in writing the Old Testament for us. It is used of the office from which Judas by transgression fell. It is used of the service rendered in the exercise of the gift of hospitality. It is used in connection with the gift of giving, translated relief in Acts chapter 11, 29. It is used of the spoken ministry of the word multiple times. It is used of the proclamation of the word of reconciliation. It is used of the management of money in the churches and provision for believers multiple times. It is used of the physical ministrations by Paul to the Corinthians and by Mark to the Apostle Paul. It is used of men who were evangelists over certain churches. It is used of the service rendered to the saints by angels in Hebrews 1.14. And so the conclusions that we reached last week, and of course that's a very quick summary of what we covered last week, the office of deacon involves humble service to other believers. The office of deacon involves the exercise of the gift of ministration. The office of deacon involves distributing the funds of the assembly in at least two different ways, to needy believers within the assembly, and to other needy assemblies of believers. The office of deacon involves the example of Christ both in its method and in its type of service. The office of deacon involves teaching and in some cases the development of the gift of evangelist. We see two of these evangelists or two of these deacons who are listed for us in the book of Acts uh, later become evangelists. Stephen very clearly so and gets stoned to death for it in the next chapter. And then of course Philip who is called Philip the Evangelist. And then finally, the office of deacon involves leadership in the church and is thus restricted to spiritually mature men. And somebody, of course, will immediately raise, well, what about Phoebe? We'll talk about Phoebe in uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 1. We'll discuss her later. But tonight we want to talk about the qualifications of deacons, which are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 7 through 16. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. And then it goes on and it speaks about the wives of the deacons next. The first word that is used here as we look at the responsibilities and the character qualifications of deacons is the word grave. Its the Greek word is semnos. It means one who is serious of purpose, has a respectability in his conduct. It denotes one who is reverend, august, or venerable, if you want to go to the dictionary definition of it. The term is also used, by the way, as a requirement for the wives down in verse 11. Even so must their wives be grave. This is a character quality that heads the list of those who would use the office of a deacon well. They must be grave. Their wives also must be grave. We find that the term is used of aged men in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, excuse me, 2 and verse 2. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, that's semnos, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And that's speaking to all of the aged 
in the church. That's not in the context merely of elders and deacons. You see, what we're dealing with here are character qualities that should be manifest throughout the body of Christ among those who are spiritually mature believers. The term semnos is also used of things that all believers are to focus on in their thinking. I think you probably all know Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And here semnos is translated by the word honest. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, semnos, that's the word for grave. Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. This is not something that is merely to be unique among deacons and elders. This is something whereby Christians should have their minds focused on that which is semnos, that which is grave serious of purpose. We serve a living God. We serve him in a world that is filled with not only danger, but with frivolity and foolishness, vanity fair as it's portrayed in Pilgrim's Progress. We are to be grave. We are to be sober-minded. We are not to be led astray by the frivolity and the foolishness of the world around us. As we emphasized last week, the spiritual offices can be filled by spiritually mature men who are leading normal Christian lives. You know, people talk about spiritual giants. No, they are not spiritual giants. They are merely living the way God envisioned for all of us as Christians to live. The reason that we look at these qualifications and think that these are the qualifications of spiritual giants is that most of us are spiritual pygmies. This is the normal Christian life that is being described for us here by these terms, as we see them also used of spiritually mature Christians in other portions of the New Testament. In other words, deacons are to take seriously the responsibility with which they have been entrusted, and thus only serious-minded men should ever be placed in this office. But all mature believers should be serious-minded. The next phrase that is used, or the next requirement that is given to us here in 1 Timothy 3, is that they are not to be double-tongued. That's the word dilogos, saying the same thing twice, but with a different view to different people, depending on their point of view. In other words, being a hypocrite, or double-tongued, as it's sometimes spoken of in our vernacular, whereby white men speak with forked tongues. He says one thing to one person. He says something else to another person. Hypocritical fawning from party to party to gain their favor with each by agreeing with whatever their view happens to be. A deacon must not be that way. He is a spiritual leader in the church. He cannot merely be a people pleaser whereby he says what people want to hear. His attitude is given first with the term grave. His speech is given second with the term not double-tongued. James talks about the tongue in James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. We don't have time to look at that tonight, though we may spend some time on it next week. But the tongue is a deadly evil. It's full of poison. It's like a fire. James talks about it and compares it with a, a rudder, very small, but it can turn about a great ship. And the tongue can turn things about in a horrendous way also. And, and James tells us that the tongue is set on fire by hell itself. He compares it with a spring of water. He says, does a spring of water send out bitter water and sweet water at the same location? No. And yet the human tongue does. A man who is going to be a deacon has to have a tongue that is in control. If his tongue is not in control, he is not spiritually mature. You see, the tongue is a demonstrator of spiritual maturity. What we say, how we say it, to whom we say what we say, and whether it changes from person to person. Not double-tongued. The next requirement says, not given to much wine. Now, there are many people who have grabbed hold of that and said, ah, oh, the deacons can drink because they're not given too much wine. Uh, I remember years ago when we were in uh, San Antonio 
And when I first taught this uh, series of lessons, and uh, we were talking about the office of a deacon, we were going over the spiritual gifts and the spiritual offices, and we had a, a program whereby every week the adults would memorize certain verses, and the children would memorize either fewer or more, depending on the age of the children. And um, this was one of the verses that the little three- and four-year-olds were memorizing, and um, they would have to say them to their teachers each week. And one of the little kids came up to quote this verse and said, Not double-tongued, not given too much wine. <laughs> A little extra O there suddenly changes the meaning, doesn't it? <laughs> Actually, this is not saying that the deacons are permitted to drink. Instead, the word that is used here, proskyontos, means to clutch to oneself, to hold firmly to. It's the word that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4 is give heed to. In other words, the deacons must not be men who clutch firmly to themselves, who hold to their, quote, rights, their so-called Christian liberty to drink. It's obvious if you entrust the monies of the church to a man like that, he is not controlled by the Spirit of God. He is controlled by liquor. Someone who insists that it is his right to drink tells you what is in control in his life in that area. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It is specifically set in contrast in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul is not saying here the, drink, the deacons can drink a little bit, but not too much. No, he is saying these are men who must not clutch to themselves that right to be able to drink. That's so called right. And a man who does so demonstrates that he is not filled with the Spirit of God, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. That naturally leads to the next requirement that we see here. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Aistron kerdes is the Greek word. It's the same as the qualification for elders back in verse 3. This is something that runs throughout church leadership, not greedy of filthy Lucre. You see, this ties in with the issue of covetousness. This is, of course, especially important for a man who is going to be in charge of funds in the church because it was at this point that Judas first failed and ultimately had his privilege and his life removed. Judas was greedy of filthy lucre. Judas was willing to sell the Lord Jesus Christ for a handful of silver coins. Oh, what men who focus on money. Oh, what depths they will go to to get it. Oh, what pain and agony they feel over it to the exclusion of the good that they are to do with it as it is entrusted to them to care for God's people. Not greedy of filthy lucre. The next phrase says, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Deacons are not only stewards of money, but they are stewards of the mystery of the faith. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Moreover, brethren, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. We find that this mystery of the faith is that revelation which was given to the apostles and the prophets in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 12. And he talks about it in great detail there. We've, we've spoken about that passage in time past. We'll not cover it again. But Paul there gives us the definition of a mystery. Things that were revealed to the Old Testament prophets, things that are now revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the Spirit, those are the things that are the mysteries not revealed in the Old Testament, but now revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the spirits. These are the things that were handed to the apostles for us. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, that they, they would pass that on to us and that we would pass that on to our children. You see, this is not a super spiritual thing. It's a normal thing for the body of Christ to take the word of God which has been handed to us and like a baton pass it on faithfully from generation to generation. Deacons will be handling material things in the church but deacons must be spiritually mature men 
skilled in their knowledge of the scripture and wise so that they might apply it properly one of the qualifications back in Acts and then they must faithfully pass it on holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience we've talked about purity or we've talked about the importance of having a clean conscience Hebrews chapter 1 and we see that uh, excuse me Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 where it tells us that the blood of Christ even cleanses our consciences. Many people have a conscience that's a dirty conscience. It's a conscience that, that they've worn out over and over and over again, feeling sorry for themselves and saying, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't done that. Listen, your conscience also comes under the blood of Christ. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? No man is qualified to be in the office of a deacon who's always going over and rehashing all the things of the past, all those bad things, and moaning and groaning and rowing as me. The blood of Christ, he's not brought it over his conscience to cleanse his conscience from dead works so that he might serve. <laughs> That's what deacons do, you know. So that he might serve the living God. It's not really cleansing our conscience so we can walk away and do nothing. It's cleansing our conscience so that we might serve the living God. Essential elements of truth that a deacon must know and a deacon must put into practice. And then it says, let these also first be proved. Rather interesting word here for prove, dokimazo. Uh, it's a, a great word and an incredible word study if we had time to do it tonight. But it deals with an intense examination. The deacons must first be examined in these areas for approval. They're not appointed until they are examined in these areas. This is a serious examination. There are so many New Testament passages that describe this kind of examination for us. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 11, 28, 2 Corinthians 8, 8. I'm not going to read them all for you, but I'm giving you the references. 2 Corinthians 8, 22, 13, 5, Galatians 6, 4, Ephesians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Hebrews, Peter, 1 John. We find this is a term, a very essential term, that the deacons must first be deeply and carefully and precisely examined, not merely in what they believe, but in terms of their life and character qualities, which is what all these things deal with that we've just been looking at. Yes, you have to examine their doctrine, but it, you must examine their lives, and most folks are too timid to examine someone's life. Most folks are too timid to say, well, you, you know, I really don't think he meets this qualification here of not double-tongued or this qualification not greedy of filthy lucre that seems to be all he ever focuses on but I, I really don't think I'd say anything about that dear folks God focuses on character he doesn't focus on whether or not you've been to seminary he doesn't focus on whether or not you were raised in the church he doesn't focus on whether or not you're popular with people and get along well with them he focuses on the character of Christ which every Christian can develop as he yields to the Spirit of God and as the Holy Spirit begins to work in his life. But these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon. Then let them use the office of a deacon. Then is there for a purpose. They are first proved. Then they are put into the office of a deacon. If you don't go through that examination, you will have men who are not qualified according to the Word of God. Being blameless. After careful examine, they must be anankletos. That's the word blameless there. It's a different word, by the way, than the word blameless in chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, we'll be talking about the blameless that is up there. Uh, it's the same word, however, that you find in Titus chapter 1, verse 6. So although the elders in 1 Timothy 3, 2 have an additional word listed for them in that passage, they also have this word, an ankletos, which is listed 
in Titus chapter 1 verse 6 where it is the office of an elder being discussed in that passage. This word does not mean sinlessly perfect. It's a word that signifies that which cannot be called to account. In other words, nothing laid to one's charge as a result of public investigation. That's why it follows here. After they have first been tested, after they have first been examined, and they are found without a charge that can be laid against them after public investigation. Pretty stiff qualifications. Well, I'm going to cut the sermon a little short tonight because I want us to see this video. Something very serious about our country. It also reminds us of the leadership that our country must have. We've been talking about deacons here. We haven't even begun to talk yet about elders. But how a man who is qualified will be a great blessing to the church, a man who is qualified will also be a great blessing to a country. We need to pray for our leaders that God will save them, that God will give them wisdom from his word, for a great deal of the Old Testament talks about godly leadership in a nation. God didn't merely give us the Old Testament so that we might learn neat stories, or so that we might have a history lesson, an ancient history. He explains to us what it is like to have godly leadership in a nation, and he explains to us what it is like to have ungodly leadership in a nation. When you have ungodly leaders, when you even have leaders who are, quote, good leaders, but who do not understand or function on the basis of biblical principles for a nation or for a national leader, you'll have trouble in your nation. That's why we pray for those whom God has put in positions of authority over us. That is why you should pray for your church leaders too. Pray that God will raise up men who, who have these qualifications, the qualifications that we see for deacons here first, then the qualifications that we see for elders. And what is the difference between an elder and a bishop? And is there a difference? And praying for those. Dear folks, do you pray for those in leadership here in this church every day? Do you pray that they will have these character qualities, that God will develop this wisdom and this honesty and this filling of the Holy Spirit in those who are leaders here in this church? You should pray for it. We're in a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual war. Satan attacks the leaders because he knows that if he can get the leaders to compromise, the people will feel comfortable in following the compromise. Oh, how hard it is to build, how easy it is to tear down. We saw that on September 11, 2001. How long it takes to build and how quickly things can be destroyed. The same is true for churches. Oh, not the buildings, though that can come down quickly. But the spiritual power, the spiritual impact, the holiness as it reaches out to a community, and then the community is open to the evangelism because they say those are people who walk with the living God. Do you walk with the living God and others when they think of you? That is how they think of you. The Bible tells us, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Character qualifications, spiritual qualifications, not merely temporal qualifications of a business degree, not merely good sense in operating your store or whatever service industry business you have. The issue is, do you have the spiritual qualifications that God says are necessary in handling His funds and dealing with His people? for it belongs to him. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the time we've had tonight to look into your word and to look at these qualifications which you have listed for us as qualifications without which no man should ever be put into the office of a deacon. Let these also first, first, first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless 
nothing that can be laid to their charge after public and careful investigation and examination. Father, again we thank you for this, your word, and we pray for your blessings upon it. For we pray it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.